All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Don DeRosa here. We're going to start in about a minute. But if you're watching and you're brand new, and this is all new to me too, so do me a favor if you can, if you want to see what comments, because I can see the comments, I think. So go ahead and comment. Just say hi that you see me and you can hear me uh, if you're there. So that way I can see the comments are working. This is all new thing. I'm broadcasting the four different places at the same time. So I can't look at all four places. So hopefully it's all right, good evening, everyone. Funnels, everything. Uh, Don DeRosa Oops. here. We're going to start in about a minute. But if you're watching and you're brand new. And so, okay. So I had to turn my computer down. I see you and hear you. Thank you very much. I can both see you and hear you. So now here's the thing. Here's how we're going to work. Uh, well, let me get started here. All right. Let me get rid of that. Welcome. Hello. And my name is Don DeRosa. And we're, welcome to the very first what I would call expert real estate coaching show. I'm going to try to do this. I've uh, been, been wanting to do this now for... God, I don't know, uh, a long time. And um, my good friend, Mr. William Tingle, he's got his podcast, I think, kicking off. I don't know, but let me know uh, if you're still doing it. But uh, I've been talking to William about this, doing my own show now for quite some time. And I finally got around to it, I think, thanks to the pandemic. But anyways, I wanted to introduce myself. Uh, we're we're going to be tackling some of what I would call the most interesting topics. Tonight, we're going to be talking about um, – it says, now I can't hear you. Uh, I'm not sure. Let me Good friend, Mr. That William Tingle, I don't know he's got his podcast, any difference. Think, kicking off. Let know, me know if you can hear me. Let me know. Uh, but today, uh, we're going to be talking uh, – I just got a few uh, things I want to talk about to just to kind of kick it off. Doing my own I'll go by any questions that you have. Time, and I got um, but I wanted to kind of just thanks to kick things off. I've been meaning to do this show for quite some time. It's not going to be a long show. I want to do 30 minutes. Uh, we're we're going to be tackling into some of what I would call the most That's interesting great. topics tonight. We're um, going to be talking about... For right now, I want to keep it short. Um, and I want to kind of get to the point. And so just by a show, uh, I mean, uh, I can't really I'm see your sure. hands. Good friend, and when you come across as my make a difference, I'll just give you an idea. But today, we're going to be talking. I just got a few things I want to talk about. Some of you may hear the initial feedback. I'll go by any questions that you have. You should not hear it But I wanted to kind of just kick things off. So I can put up comments that you may. It's not going to be a long show. Like this right here. But if you notice, your name doesn't come across. We're going to be tackling some of what I would call the most interesting topics. You're still hearing an echo. But I'm talking about for right now, I want to keep it short. Um, Shouldn't hear an echo I want to now. Kind of get to the, but I'll. Shouldn't hear an echo. So I don't. I guess I can put my little headset on and see. But you guys should not hear an echo now. You did it first because I had my computer turned up. Uh, okay, good. So better. So somebody said better. All right. Because at first you did, because I had my computer volume turned up and you heard the computer volume um, coming through my computer and then re and kind of echoed. Okay, great. No echo now. Great. Perfect. All right. So as you can see, I can put comments up on the screen. So any comments that you ask, I'd love to know your name because it doesn't come across. You can see unknown. And I'd love to know your name. So if you can kind of, if you're going to give me a question, put your name. And then um, that way I know who you are. Otherwise, it comes up as unknown. And I'd love to know who's out there. I'll, I'll be able to go back later and see who made comments. But right now, just live, I can't see who makes comments unless I'm clicking in uh, all the different sites. But, you know, I kind of want to do this because, you know, we're faced with this pandemic. And... I don't know what most of you have experienced, if most of you have been around uh, through the 2008 era where, I mean, kind of everything went to hell in a handbasket, pardon my language. But those of us that were able to stumble through it and make it out alive are now faced with looking at this same thing again 
And in fact, as a matter, you know, I mean, I haven't seen the numbers. I didn't look today. I, I meant to look, but I didn't look today to see what unemployment numbers. I thought they came out on Tuesday, and maybe I'm wrong. If you can put on your comments what they are, if you found, if you know what they are. But I know last week we were over 26 million people unemployed. Now, I don't know if that's actually reached out and touched any of you, but it's going to have a severe impact into our economy if it already, if it hasn't already for a lot of you. So I want to talk about, at least initially, until we can get some comments going, or if, if, but there's reasons, that, I always say there's three reasons businesses fail. And, you know, I have, let me go ahead and throw it up here on the screen. Uh, you might be able to see it. Um, all right. I'll even put me up there in the corner. I'll, there we go. So, at least for the time being, there's three reasons businesses fail. The first one is management. The second one is marketing. And the third one is money. And we're gonna, I'm going to kind of go over those right now. And I guess the main reason for me to say this is a lot of you may be new. A lot of you may be starting this for the very first time. And this may be, or maybe you have, we, I mean, let's face it. We have been in a seller's market. And if you don't know what a seller's market is, then... That's where inventory is extremely low, meaning there's not a lot of houses on the market or there's a lot of people buying. So there's a lot of competition. Well, when that happens, prices tend to drive up. Uh, house, home prices tend to climb. Inventory stays pretty low. Sellers get top dollar for their property. People tend to bid on that or overbid on that. And we have been, we've gone, and, and real estate as a general goes in a cycle right? Uh, we're in, we'll start off maybe in a buyer's market, then we'll go to a seller's market, then we'll go back to a buyer's market. And we'll, so that, that's known as a real estate cycle. And in my career, I've been doing this a little over 20 years now. I've seen two, almost three, what I call three cycles, right? I saw it in the late 90s, early 2000s, and we saw it again in 2008. And now we're going to see it again in 2020. Now, historically, Historically, um, it's been about every 10 years, 11 years, and we've kind of overstayed the, the we've kind of overgone the, the, the norm, right? And now what's happening is over the last six months to a year, we haven't gone from a seller's market into a full-blown buyer's market, but we were in the process, in my opinion, of transitioning. And I would love any comments that anybody has about, you know, whether they feel this is true or not, or whether they're feeling that. And I'd love to know where you, by the way, put your comments where you're from, like where you're located. I'm assuming because our Facebook groups mostly are in Georgia, but who knows where everyone is from because we just, I don't know where you guys come from. So I would love to know any comments that you have. But going into... Six months ago, a little bit more before the pandemic, we were noticing in the market that prices were starting to, they were starting to cling, you know, starting to stagger a bit, right? Or starting to falter a little bit. And houses were staying on the market longer. Um, and houses were staying on the market longer. And we were starting to see where we had never seen before a price drop. Now, houses would be out there, and normally houses would only be out there maybe a month, and that would be extremely long for a property to sit on the market. You'd have to have a really bad renovation, or it'd have to be in, it, can't even, it wouldn't even have to be in bad shape, because the ones that were in bad shape were getting snapped up like crazy, but it would have to be a really, really bad renovation, or just a seller that is completely off their rocker with the price that they wanted for a house to sit that long. Well, then all of a sudden we were seeing that prices started to dip, not dip to the point where sellers really 
noticed it, but we as investors noticed a $5,000 price drop, $10,000 price drop. Uh, oh, that's right. Okay, every Thursday. So somebody said, let me put this up there. This is, uh, I'm not sure who put this comment out there, but it says unemployment claims are reported on Thursday. Okay, so thank you very much for that. I'll make that a little smaller for you. Uh, so thank you. So I guess I'll have to wait till Thursday. But last week they were 26 million. Prior to that, the highest in our history was 650,000 in 1982. But uh, most of us weren't around. I mean, I was around, but it didn't really affect me. I didn't really think about it. I was, I don't know how old I was. I was 14, 15, something like that. But anyways, I do remember the gas prices back then and the fact that there was a gas shortage back in the late 70s. Um, so we're into something similar. Okay, Johnny. Thank you, Johnny. Um, but anyways, so we've been transitioning and then all of a sudden this pandemic hit and that took what we were supposed to have as a very slow glide into a seller's market. I'm sorry, a buyer's market, which is historically how it goes. We are now probably going to be forced into a deep dive. Now, I put this slide up here. There's three reasons businesses fail. And I don't care what business you're in. doesn't really matter to me. But there's three reasons all businesses fail. And I hope that, uh, you know, if you're lis listening to this you and you're looking to do this as your business and you're brand new, pay attention to these three areas. And the first one is management. Now, most people think management. Well, management comes in many different forms. Management can come in you as the person that owns the business having no real direction or focus. Okay, you don't have a plan. You're not very well time-oriented, et cetera, or you don't use poor systems. I mean, how many people, you know, I wish I was, had you live here, but if you could raise your hand, how many people work for a company that you come home every night and go, oh, my God, I can't believe this company stays in business? Well, those are the types of businesses in, the, in economies like this that ultimately fail because they are not well managed, okay? And that business could be someone that has no direction or clear focus. Um, I mean, think about it. You come home and you, how many people think their manager has no clue what they're doing, right? Or management in general doesn't have a clue. Or companies that put poor systems in place, Okay, so all of those things, let me see if I can get comments, make sure there's no comments coming in. Um, but <clears throat> then you have poor technology. I used to work for a company that they thought during busy times of the year, the way to do that was they would throw manpower at it. And then when the busy times were over, they just laid people off. Well, in my opinion, that's not the right way to do it. They should be investing in technology or in our field, it's education. Education becomes the critical thing for uh, our business. So a lack of education in this business, in buying and selling real estate, it truly, truly is the more you know, the more you'll make. Okay. So what I wanted to say is if you want to get into this business now, now is, the, in my opinion, the best time in the world to get into real estate investing. And people tend to do it reverse. They tend to jump out when they should jump in, and they jump in when they should jump out, uh, especially if you're new. And now is the time most people are going, oh, you know, everybody wants to jump in right now. But when the crap hits the fan and houses are harder to sell, and you don't use the traditional methods like I can list the property or I use cash, people tend to go, okay, this is too difficult for me. And they tend to jump out. Well, what you need to learn now is the education part. And we've got a lot of things coming up or I've got a lot of things. I'm helping a lot of different people uh, get that education. That's going to come in the form of owner finance, right? You're going to need to learn how to own or finance because sellers are going to be in trouble. I mean, we've got, think about this. We talk about in this business um, dealing with what I call motivated sellers. People who have a need to sell versus a want to sell. Well, a motivated seller could be someone that are, that's behind on payments, um, foreclosure, 
uh, lost their job, two payments, a probate. And those those types of motivations have been around forever. But with 26 million people out of work, they're going to need a resource, help to help them solve their problem, and which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. And um, But I wanted to get through these three reasons. So the first reason, obviously, is management. If you've got good, clear picture, you've got good focus, and you're not what I call a dog chasing six rabbits and trying to catch the shiny penny and you're focused and, and, you, and you're diligent, this can be a very lucrative business. The second thing is marketing. Um, the reason businesses fail is, I mean, let's think about it. If I wanted to open a flower shop or a donut shop or any kind of retail business, any business for that matter, Marketing becomes the lifeblood of that business. So think about it. If I wanted to do a flower shop, the first thing I did, first thing I would do is I would have to learn. So I'd have to go and get the management side of this. And I would have to learn the ins and outs of the business. I may have to get brick and mortar place. I may have to learn how to do flower arrangements. Or if it's a donut shop, I may need to know how to make the donuts. I need to know where to get all the stuff. So that's the management side. But then you have the marketing side. And marketing comes in and people, you either don't do enough of it or you end up marketing to the wrong person. Well, in a seller's market, the one we've been in, that's irrelevant because inventory is low. People are just you know, hoarding. I mean, homeowners are just throwing any price out there and investors or homeowners that want to buy because the inventory is so low, they're willing to pay just about anything. Lenders are willing to pay because prices are up. So everything's great and happy. Well, we're about to change that and that things are about to change. And I hope I'm wrong. And I really hope I'm wrong. But I've been through this in 2008 and to a certain extent at the late 2000s, early 2000s, I mean, late 90s. Um, So I want to get ahead of the game or ahead of the curve. So if you want to start doing and and buying real estate in this market, you're going to need to learn how to uh, buy creatively because there's going to be more properties on the market than ever before. So we're going to quickly, I mean, where we were supposed to just kind of flatten into a, a, a buyer's market. Now I think we're going to have a rapid decline into a buyer's market. In fact, I just had a conversation with someone that they said a friend of theirs in Florida was a was a lender, and they're foreclosing on ten properties or twenty properties like next month because the person hasn't paid. Well, people were going scratching their head, going, "Well, wait a minute. The government said that they were going to suspend foreclosures and evictions." No, that's not what the government said. You just heard what you wanted to hear. The government said for government-type loans and programs, they will suspend uh, foreclosures. But you have to understand, each state is specific. It is not federally mandated. So, for example, Florida, for example, is a judicial state, meaning you have to file a lawsuit. Uh, Georgia, on the other hand, is what's called a non-judicial state. Meaning we don't have to go through the court system. We, the, when, we, when you buy a house here in Georgia, you sign what's called a waiver of borrower's rights and you waive your right to judicial foreclosure. Okay, It is a state-specific ruling. Now, most states are going by the rules or going by, you know, by the government policies because obviously that's the right thing to do, but it's not necessary, necessarily the legal thing to do. They're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Now, what's that mean to us as investors? What that means is when everybody gets done playing nicely, I mean, everybody is now on the the page of we need to help each other, and rightfully so. But just like we saw in the Gulf War, just like we saw when Bush went to when the, the second Gulf War, just when we, I mean, anytime there is a, um, a sense of, of, of demise in our country, we pull together temporarily. And then afterwards, and this is just my opinion, 
then afterwards, all the fingers starts to point and people start to get back to business. And at the end of the day, it's really all about money, you know, dollars and cents. So we've, I've already seen though, there's, if you have, if you get on like Apple news or whatever, I follow this a lot. Banks are already to the point where they're looking for bailouts. So, and we haven't even been a few months into this thing. Uh, you'll notice, and some of you may say, well, it's funny that you say that because interest rates aren't going down, even though the Fed put it at zero. Well, that's a different interest rate, okay? And you have to understand how banks work. Banks work by create, because a lot of these banks are small banks. And what they do is they have their own set of money, their warehouse line, and they lend, they, they get someone to come in and they lend out that money to buy that property. And then what they do, they get, once they get a group of these, pa- these loans, package them all up and sell them off and replenish that warehouse line. Well, the, the, the reason the interest rates haven't come down with the Fed's, the regular Fed interest rate is because whatever that interest rate is, whatever that loan product is, it has to be appealing enough when this is all over to be sold. Uh, okay, it has to be has to be able to be sold. So that's why you're not seeing banks drop interest rates. Now that may eventually, they may eventually drop some interest rates later, but right now you may even see interest rates climb because they have to produce better loans so that when this is over, they can sell them to the bigger banks and replenish their lines of credit. So if you understand some of those things, then you'll that'll make more sense to you. So how do we do this? So how do we maneuver through this? And I know this was going to be a 30 minute show and I'm already 23 minutes into it. So this may be a little bit longer than I anticipated, but I want to get through this stuff because I think it's extremely important for anybody listening, how this thing is going to go. And again, this is just my opinion. And you know, that as they say, opinions, you know, everybody has their opinions, right? I'll tell you, I don't know what I really want to say though the real phrase, but management, marketing. So marketing becomes the second piece people don't go and, you know, fail. So if if I didn't know how to make flowers, I got to first learn that. Then I can't just stick a sign in the front door and say open for business. Yeah, that'll get a few people coming in off of the off the foot traffic, but it's not going to drive my business. I'm not going to stay in business very long. So I have to market. And uh, that's going to be the biggest issue is marketing, getting people to raise their hand and say, hey, I'm interested. And in our business in the real estate world, you have what we're looking for is we're looking to help people um, with their problem. And I tell people all the time, you're, I don't really consider myself a real estate investor. I consider myself a problem solver. All right. And my job is to solve the problem. And whatever that means, that might mean cash meaning pay all cash, or that might mean solve a different problem, meaning cash may not solve that problem. Maybe uh, finding them another place and taking over their house subject to. Um, yeah, I don't really want to put that one. Someone made my statement for me in the comments, and I don't really want to uh, put that comment out there. But but thank you for uh, putting out there what I was going to say. All right. So marketing becomes extremely critical and it's just like anything else. If you don't tell people what you do, I mean, think about your, I mean, how many people have seen a pizza shop open up in a strip mall and they have great tasting food. And then six months later, they're out of business. Why? Because the person that opened it had great tasting food, but they didn't know the other aspects of the business. They didn't work. They work. They were too busy working in their business and not working on their business. So, that's number two. Number three is obviously money. The thing that makes the world go around. And as we're seeing things that don't make the world go around. So, I mean, this is not just a, uh, the last time this went, ha- this happened in 2008, it was self-inflicted. The banks, I hate to say it, they did it, they did it, they, they did it upon themselves, right? They had really crappy loans. They had bad processes. They just, 
they didn't have their arms around it. They got greedy and they just didn't. And then they went and we had to bail them out as a nation. Now that affected the global economy, but it didn't affect it like it is now. I mean, we are in a meltdown of a global economy and it's good and bad in the same respect that everybody's in the same boat. Right. So we all are going to have to pull together and to get us out of this thing. But there is going to be lots of casualties along the way. And I hate to say it that way, but it's the truth. Um, So in order for us to manage through this process, first, you need to understand why a business fails. And then once you understand why it fails, then you can understand how to avoid it. You're never going to avoid these three steps that I just put up there. You're never going to avoid them. You're always going to have, so just the time when you think you got it all figured out and you've got, you're educated, you've got your company in order and you're doing marketing, then you got to market. And once you market, guess what you need? You need money. Now, money comes in all kinds of forms. You need to have enough to get started and you need to have enough to keep going. So you need cash today and cash flow tomorrow. So that's a big component. Now, I'll always preach that you don't need money to make money. You need money to make money, but it doesn't have to be your money. Okay, you can use other people's money. There's lots of people out there that have money to lend because they're getting nothing in whatever their other investments are, as long as the deal is good. And that's your job, your job, which segues me into the next. My next slide is in order for you to be a problem solver, you can't just go and say, I'll pay you all cash. That's not going to work in this economy. Paying all cash is not going to work. I mean, some, I mean, cash is always going to be king, but you need to understand all the different buying strategies. You, in order for you to be a problem solver, you have to first understand what the problem is. And in order to understand what the problem is, you first must ask questions. Well, asking the right questions is paramount. So I'm going to put these up. In my opinion... These are what I would call, for the most part, all of the buying strategies that you might come across. There might be a one or two more that I'm missing out there, but I doubt it. Okay? I doubt it. But maybe. Who knows? But the first one, and I'm going to go down these quickly. If you don't know what these are, therein lies why I'm telling you you need to educate yourself. Because... Subject to, for example, subject to the existing loan is where you can literally, someone will deed over the property to you. They they give you the ownership and you just simply take their mortgage payment and you start making it to the bank. So if their mortgage is with, let's say, Bank of America and they give you the deed and you start making the payments to the bank and the loan stays in their name, everything stays in their name, except the ownership of the property, it gets transferred to you. Now, some of you may have a bunch of questions on that, and that's fine. Uh, at the end, I will put up my information. You're happy to, you can ha- you can easily ask me. I'm going to have an event coming up on Subject 2, so if you want to learn more, you can certainly go to that. Um, but just so you know, that is a technique that is probably, in my opinion, I don't know if uh, William Tingle's still on, but if he can't, if he wants to chime in, um, subject to, in my opinion, is the most powerful technique in real estate today. It allows you to control an enormous amount of real estate with uh, no what I call legal liability. You don't have to go down and qualify for the loan. It doesn't go on your credit report. Now, hear me when I say this. Even though that's the case, you still have, because when you promise to make someone's payment and they deed you the property, right, you have a moral and an ethical obligation to do that. So even though you don't have a legal reason or requirement, it's a stronger ethical obligation and a moral obligation to do so. So if you don't intend to do that and make those payments, don't use that technique, plain and simple. Okay. But what it does do is it allows you to, it allows you to buy more properties because it allows you to take smaller amounts of cash because if somebody's behind two, three, four, five thousand dollars behind on their mortgage payment, you can buy that property, 
bring those payments current for four or five thousand and take over a three hundred thousand dollar loan without having to go down and put 10 15 20 percent down qualify for the loan et cetera et cetera so there's lots of techniques like that subject to the existing you can do that there's subject to the first and shorting the second so if they have a second mortgage you can do that um we're already at 31 minutes so this may have to be an hour show i don't know i tend to tend to talk long um but then you have subject to with the modification and that's where it modification. Um, um, I can't tell if that's you, William, that put that comment, but someone says on uh, this is, I don't under, I don't know them. It says 17 years now and I'm still, it's still my favorite way to buy. So again, if you don't mind until I get uh, people's names to show up on here, just kind of throw your, at least your first name uh, in where at the beginning of your comment. That way it'll help. Um, I don't know if that was you, William, or not. If it is, just give me a thumbs up. And that'll tell me. But um, but subject to with a modification. A modification is someone... Oh, Linda Dana. Okay. I'll put Linda. Welcome, welcome, Linda. I've been meaning to call you, by the way. We need to get together. Um, but anyways... Subject to with a modification is where you the, the, the homeowner modifies the loan. Maybe you have a higher interest rate, 6.5%, 7%, which is way out of the norm now. But maybe it's an older loan. And they can't afford that 6.5%, 7% loan. Well, you can go back to the lender. We can modify the, lend, modify the loan down to maybe 2%. And I'm going to tell you, if you're not aware of certain terminology going forward, you need to be. One of the things that are going to be coming up for you to really get your arms around is going to be short sales. You need to understand what it is, what it means, so you can explain it to the homeowner. Deferment. So you need to understand what the word deferment is and how it affects the homeowner. And number two, or number three, forbearance. Because those are all the terms right now that banks are throwing around. And those are going to be solutions that banks are going to come to homeowners with, and they're going to have lots of questions for that. So you being the expert and understanding so that you can show them how to do this and what it means will gain instant credibility with your homeowner, and you can even help them. And there's nothing wrong with helping somebody save their home, even if you don't get anything out of it, because there's going to be lots of people that you try to save their home and you simply can't. Okay, and you're not going to be able to buy everything. So please don't be a greedy person out there that tries to take advantage of this situation. Do the right thing. Say and help people with their situation. Be the problem solver. And sometimes you will get the home and buy it. And that's a win. And sometimes you will help the homeowner. A lot of times you will help the homeowner and allow them to continue living their family, living in their home just by helping them through the process. And there's nothing wrong with that either, right? So please don't just try to, don't think of this as a, a way to take advantage of everything. That's not what I'm telling you because there's going to be some real problems out here. And if we don't take, we saw this in 2008. If you take all these properties back into the banks, it will literally collapse the infrastructure because the banks will default and the FDIC will come in and they will shut their doors. We saw this in 2008. There were banks, multiple banks daily uh, being shut down by the FDIC, right? And, I mean, there were entire websites that, that would post this stuff, like a, almost like a ticker that would say, okay, this bank failed today. This bank failed today. This bank failed. And they were almost proud of that, right? But it was remarkable to see how many banks, especially the little banks, failed because... And I don't know that you're aware of this, but when a loan gets behind more than 90 days, the banks have to report that to the Federal Reserve. Up until 90 days, prior to 90 days, that's just, a, that's just they're just late payments, right? When you go past 90 days, that now becomes a penalty to the lender and it becomes in a true default situation for them. And they actually get penalized. And if they have enough of that default, the banks will come in and say, okay, you're insolvent. We need to take those loans. 
and you got to, we're going to have to shut your doors. So in order to avoid that, we need to solve as many problems out there in the community as we possibly can. And that means being able to own or finance or creatively buy these deals as much as humanly possible. So you do that by understanding what the buying strategies are. Um, subject to wraparound mortgage. If you don't know what a wraparound mortgage is, now is not the time for me to tell you what a wraparound mortgage is, but it's just another owner finance property or another owner finance technique that you can use that will allow the owner to take back a note so that you can pay them and they pay the bank to keep them solvent. It's an owner finance, so you don't have to go down and qualify for it at Bank of America, so on and so forth. Uh, agreement for deed, I don't recommend it in Georgia uh, because we have such a, a rapid foreclosure state, but other states, uh, it, I can highly recommend it, especially if you're in a judicial state. Um, owner financing, if they have a hot property that is free and clear that you just can't get out from under uh, or they can't sell it because there's too much, too, uh, it's in too bad a shape. You might be able to owner finance it. I mean, I am owner financing two. I'm gonna. I'm looking at owner financing two or three right now. Um, we had a lady that. I'm. Um, it's worth two hundred, three hundred thousand on a normal market. Now these a bunch of work, so don't get me wrong. But my offer was sixty thousand dollars, and zero down, and three hundred dollars a month, and it was zero percent interest for ten years. And they're thinking about taking that offer. Okay, that's a true owner finance type offer where they don't owe anything on it and they just need some cash and or they just want out from under it because it's kind of dwindling away. So there's tons of properties that are going to come to you like that. You just have to understand how to deal with them. Okay, and if you don't, in fact, I just did a creative deal structuring class at Atlanta Rhea uh, this past weekend. I'm also going to be doing, I've been asked to do one by Atlanta Cash Buyers. So I'm also posting this on Atlanta Cash Buyers group page. So uh, Mohammed asked me to do that same event for you guys. So if you're an Atlanta Cash Buyer, uh, I'm going to do that event again. So stay tuned. I'll probably have more information once I solidify the dates for that. I'll put it up on Thursday when I'm back online Thursday. I'm also doing a subject to event at Atlanta Rhea on the 15th or 16th. I don't know. Let me look at my calendar. So I want to make sure I give you the right date. So you're not. Don't have my glasses, but May 16th. So May 16th. So if you are interested in signing up for that, I think it's, uh, Aria, I'll put this up there, aria.us slash sub two. So I'll put that up there. I don't have a date for the creative deal structuring class yet, but if you're interested in those, there'll be two opportunities for you, for me to spend a lot more time with you to go over how to be a transaction engineer. Okay. So there's other things like owner finance, subject, uh, sandwich lease option. Maybe you don't have any money. Well, being able to do a lease with an option to purchase and then turning around and finding another buyer to lease and option it from you and you kind of keep the stuff in the middle, that's a way to do it if you have very little money. Or wholesaling that lease option where you get a fee and you walk away. Uh, there's also options. In fact, I just had a student that he had a deal that doesn't work any way, shape, or form for him to go in and put money into it. But we were able to create a way where if he took an option and then found someone, okay, to buy it with a 20, because the, the, here's the, the, the crux of the whole, that whole deal is their guy, the, per, the seller is $18,000 behind. Okay, and the numbers, when you add all that up, they really didn't work for an investment. But for someone that's a homeowner that had his 20% down, for example, that home is a nice home that that home would work, could work. So if he took an option on that property and just said, hey, let me go see if I can find somebody and went out there and found an option and found somebody to give that 20 grand, that $18,000 could now take to be paid off. And now he can be in the middle of that. So 
that one deal that most people would walk away from, we were able to do just with a simple option agreement. And the option is just one piece of paper that says, hey, I'm going to option your property. I'm going to I'm gonna take the option to buy your property at a dollar amount here. And then I'm going to go kind of market it and see if I can get it up here, right? And see if I can find somebody that will buy it up here. And when they say yes, then we do a technique called a double close, okay? And some of you may say, well, no bank, no mortgage or uh, no uh, – Attorneys or title companies do double close. That's not true. That's a very false statement. So you need if that's if that's really your statement, um, you need to find another closing attorney. But we have cash, and then we have one thing that's going to be coming up um, really big is a short sale, and that's going to be a very very popular technique. Um, I'm not sure who this is, but it says need to get you to come back to Charlotte. Oh, that's probably Linda again. Um, yes, I would love to come back to Charlotte. Uh, so, but then if you go on the selling side, these are all the ways to sell properties now. So the key to thriving in this economy is. Find the ways to buy. Find, ask your seller all the questions, like how much do you owe? What's it worth? What's your payment? What's your interest rate? Ask all what I call the uncomfortable questions, right? Get all the financials of that and why they're selling. Why are you selling? Or is it two payments? Is it death in the family? Is it job loss? Is it foreclosure? What is the reason why you're selling? And then try to fit the problem into one of these solutions. I should be pointing this way. Into one of these solutions, right? Can I buy this house subject to? Okay, and again, if you don't understand what these techniques are, this is a case in point of where you need, you need to learn this because you'll never survive a two th another 2008 if you don't understand these. You will be on to another business, getting another job, doing something else, if you can't understand and maneuver through these, because you will limp along, literally limp along. You will, you might make it through, but you will not thrive. And in this type of economy, and I tell people all the time, I tell all my students all the time, look, we as in real estate investors, creative real estate investors, I should say, we tend to make more money in a down economy or a bad economy because of the chaos that happens because people panic and they don't have any, they don't understand their choices. They're not educated enough to understand what to do. And that's where we come in to educate them, to show them what are some of the possibilities out there that they can do other than list it with a realtor and have it sit on the market for six months to a year. I mean, back in 2008, properties were sitting for a year before they even had people look at them. And they're predicting the same thing. Now, I don't, I hope they're all wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope we come out of this thing, this, this stay in place or shelter in place, and the economy gets back to normal as quickly as it, you know, did as it went under, right? So I want you to kind of understand and at least get in your mind what's going to happen and what you should be prepared for. Um, now, I'm going to open it up for just a few questions because I want to wrap this up because I don't want to be here longer than an hour. 45 minutes is more than I wanted to be here. So if you have any questions, please put them in the comments so that I can answer them. Otherwise, we're going to keep, I'm going to show, while, while I'm doing that, I'm going to kind of close it down unless there's questions. And I'm going to put some things up here, see if I can put um, by the way, um, let me take this off and go back to me, <clears throat> but I wanted to share with you, this is what we will be doing every Tuesday. Let me get that on my face every Tuesday and Thursday. So if you're interested, we're going to be streaming to these four things. Um, we're going to be doing youtube.com by the way. Um, if you are on, if you're on YouTube, you probably already have done this, but if you're not a YouTube follower of mine, um, I need to get to a thousand YouTube followers so that I can stream live using my phone. So if you get a moment, 
and you're inclined to do so, please do me a favor. Go to youtube.com slash Donderosa2 and do me a favor and give me a subscribe and a, and a like and even a follow because when I do things like this, it'll pop up saying, hey, I'm doing a live event or I'm going to be doing a lot more stuff on there. Um, so please, if you haven't, you know, go, go give me a like, uh, subscribe so I can get me to my thousand uh, subscribers so I can take my phone at places and do live streams. Okay. So when we go do renovations and things like that, I can be streaming live to YouTube right now. Uh, since I don't have a thousand people, I can't do that. I got to do it from a laptop. So I'm also going to be doing Facebook, uh, groups out of Atlanta cash buyers, um, real expert, real estate coaching and property protege. I'm also coming out with a podcast it's called Expert Real Estate Coaching. It's a podcast. It is not on any of the services yet because I'm still in the process of recording my first six or seven uh, interviews. I've got half of them done. Um, so we're moving along. So I would expect another week or so before you'll see some more announcements on my, my podcast. But we're coming out with that. And also you can go to Property Protege Group. Um, to watch this if you're a member. That's a, both these are, all these are private, by the way. Atlanta Cash Buyers, Expert Real Estate Coaching, and thank you, Penny Day. She just subscribed to my YouTube channel. You're awesome. Uh, Property Protege is also uh, a closed coaching group. So if you're interested in coaching and you're in anywhere in the United States, because we do, we stream everything we do live, and we give you lots of stuff. So if you're interested, let me see if I can put up a, a little slide. You can go to, you can, you can go online right here to area.us PPG online and sign up for Wednesday. We do this every Wednesday. And right now it's free to the general public. So you can go on there and we, it's similar to this, but it's about three hours, right? So grab a snack and get in a comfortable chair, right? So we have a curriculum. We have, we'll, I'll be able to tell you, we started at 630, but if you're interested in group coaching and it's really, really inexpensive now because of we've literally dropped the price to an insignificant amount when it comes to real estate. So you're going to want to check that out if you're interested, but you also, but also, um, if you want to go check out more information, you can also go to ppgcoaching.com. Uh, that's another site uh, that we'll, that's on group coaching. But we're also going to be doing an event at uh, um, Atlanta Cash Buyers. So look for that event. I don't have a link up yet for that because he hasn't given that to me yet. But on Thursday, I'll have a link for you to go register for that creative deal structuring seminar. And I'm debating on whether I want to do a half a day, a full day, or a couple hours. It's probably going to be a minimum of a half a day uh, or a maximum of an all day thing because I just did one at Atlanta Rhea, same event, and it took all day. And you might think to yourself, how in the heck can you talk all day sitting behind a desk? I do it every day. So anyways, if you're interested in any of those, feel free. Please, like I said, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I would really appreciate that. If you want to uh, go to our PPG coaching or our, go to get some free coaching, go to PPG or area.us slash PPG online. So and I will put this up there shortly. Let's get rid of that for you. And I don't have any more questions or anything, anything that um, is out there. But I hope you enjoyed tonight. I know I went longer than my 30 minutes. And to be quite honest with you, anybody that knows me knows that for me, I barely get started at 30 minutes. So we're going to do our best, or I'm going to do my best to keep it at 30 minutes. But don't be surprised if I go over by a little bit. It's just my nature. Um, so 
Again, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give me a thumbs up. Please give me a like. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I hope to be bringing you a lot more. We're going to be diving into more specific things. This was more of a general kickoff uh, video. But we're going to get into specific things like subject to and wraparound mortgages and how to talk to sellers, how to negotiate, um, how to be better time managers. Because I'm going to tell you what, most of you, the reason you're not succeeding is not because you're not smart enough. Every single person out there is smart enough. It's because you're not organized well enough. Okay, so we're going to be diving into a lot of that because that's the type of thing in my normal seminar curriculums that we go through throughout the year. I don't do enough of that. I don't do enough of the organization, organizational stuff. This is going to allow me to get more organizational while you attend some of those other things that I do. And I can get it all in because I have more time to do all that. So hopefully you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful day. And again, this is Don DeRosa with Expert Real Estate Coaching. See you on Thursday, 7 o'clock. Have a great day.